you have written a novel uh, in, in the genre of maybe like a John Grisham, who I love. By the way, I met John Grisham, and uh, how annoying is this for you, Mike, when people meet you and tell you something that they like about you, and then they just leave it at that. I meet John Grisham, and then I'm just standing there next to him, and I go, I love the time to kill. He says, thank you. And I just, he just looks at me like, you know, being polite, and I go, yeah, I, I also love the client. He's like, thank you. Yeah. Please get this guy away from me. Like, I didn't know what else to do. But anyway. He's, um, he's, a, brilliant, he's a brilliant, <clears throat> brilliant yeah. writer. But, but you're taking from your uh, life as a lawyer and putting it in this novel. Um, explain kind of the parallels to real life, including the two rich uh, oil uh, brothers. Well, the Swanson brothers, of course, are kind of a takeoff on the Koch brothers, but they're they they're really a composite. I mean, every every character in there is a composite. Uh, Nicholas Deca Thomas, the lead lawyer, there is a composite of many lawyers that I've known in 35 years. All of the characters really are. The Swanson brothers are really, I guess, if you look at them, they are that they they are that quality of uh, they're an entity that works in the shadows all the time. They're all the they're they're the ones that are fixing elections that we don't even know about, fixing races that we don't know about. They're the ones that are pumping money that looks so innocent into a school board race because they want to completely change. If you can imagine local races as much as they want to change national races, they're the people that um, you know that Hillary Clinton attacked years ago and said there is a you know there's a right wing conspiracy in this country and everybody laughed at her and said you're crazy. There's no such thing. Well, they, they're ex exhibit A of that right-wing conspiracy when you start figuring out what they do, how much money they have to spread around, and how successful they really are. I mean, it's gotten to the point with the Swanson-type brothers where, you know, the Koch brothers bu are buying universities right now, Pete. They bought Fro Florida State, for God's sake. Uh, they, they bought the business department at Florida State. So uh, there's, and there's a lot more, um, and you're referring to, you know, um, organizations like ALEC, I think. Yes. There's a lot more that's being done at the state and local level. I think uh, Americans don't understand. We're so focused on national elections because of probably because of national media and probably because of the cons uh, consolidation of local media that we don't have a reporter at the state house uh, anymore. We used to have that. So we're not getting accurate journalism about local issues and um, organizations, certain organizations on the right and left probably take advantage of that. But certainly an organization like, like ALEC, uh, which is what is the American Legislative something um, yeah. group. They, they, they write legislation. They actually they, go they, to. Expl explain that, Mike, at the state <clears throat> level, how much impact that has. In Florida, we actually found that our the, the state legislature, and it wasn't just Florida, it was several states, but the uh, we found that our legislators were actually taking word for word the uh, the bill that Alec would write, whether it's about education, whether it's about abortion, whether it's about climate, wh whatever it is, they would take that bill and they wouldn't change a word. They would simply sign off on it. The reason we saw that happening is Alec has a very, uh, it's a very sophisticated, it's a very elegant system that they use to capture these politicians. They, they wine and dine them. They send them to these exotic and unusual seminars and places, exotic places like, you know, the islands or California, wherever it may be, really nice settings. And they have an entire week to indoctrinate those people. And so when, when it comes down to the legislative process, they write the bill, they hand it to the legislator, and this legislator simply goes and passes the bill word for word. Now, where it comes to, uh, and, and, and that's from the top to bottom. We're talking about, I'm talking about races. Alec is involved in races all the way down to school boards, all the way down to county commissions. For example, we have the Koch brothers involved in in county commission races because they want fracking. And so they feel like if they can take care of the county commissioners, they can take care of the local politicians, then they can frack in the backyard. So we, we think if we win the White House or if we win the Senate and the House that all things are well, it's not. Howard Dean told us years ago, he said, unless you capture control of the 50 states, local politics, you're going to lose. You're going to be gerrymandered out of existence. And sure enough, that's what happened to exactly. us. Exactly. Exactly what happened. And don't you think that that is why we should always push back on on these articles and these ideas of people saying, "Oh, the the death knell of the Republican Party." Yeah, it's going to be very hard for a Republican to win the White House based on voting demographics and the way the electoral college works. But at the state level, they have a whole bunch of state houses, they have a whole bunch of governors, um, and and the and the Republican Party is alive and well in many states and will remain 
so. Is it fair to say, Mike? Do we Lo- agree on that? Exactly. I totally agree because politics is local. All they have to do is win locally. And the, cul- the, 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 the culmination of all that, when it's this giant leap, you see, when they can win 40 out of 50 states, they make a giant leap with their ideology, whether or not that ideology is reflected in the White House, whether or not it's reflected in the Senate. It doesn't make any difference. A guy like, uh, well, look, like this, you could take a politician that can say the most outrageous things and back where he's elected, they really don't care right. because he's a reflection of that guy who lives down the road. So politics locally is what we have to overcome. Howard Dean was right about that. We ignored it. It was an arrogance that both liberals and progressives said, gee whiz, we don't have to worry about that small stuff. And that small stuff has us in exactly the situation we're in right now. Let me ask you, uh, we're talking to Mike Papantonio. His new uh, novel, Law and Disorder, I've been reading it. It's a legal thriller. It's really well written. It's great. Mike is great. been a uh, longtime fan of yours. Um, Mike, give us one more parallel from your new novel, Law and Disorder, that deals with the real-life issues that we have to deal with every day in the United States of America. Well, here it is, Pete. Thank goodness that you're out there. Thank goodness social media is out there because stories would never be told. That book, this book, focuses on the death of corporate media. Thank goodness for the Young Turks and Ring of Fire and what you do and all these Sam Cedar and all these people out there working so hard to get the message out there. Thank goodness for you, because the good news is there's a trend taking place. Eight, as you know, 18 to 35 year olds don't watch the nightly news, but they do listen to Pete Dominic. And well, they, I, and, I and, think and, that's really interesting. We're, I, I can argue we're corporate media, but we're we're subscriber base. And and I just say, as far as we're concerned, you know, we don't have editorial interference from above. We have arguments, but you know, we we, we have a, a great amount of freedom here. But I want to ask you. Do you think in the future media will be decentralized and, and it will be more of a democracy, more of a meritocracy where there's no serious exam, there's no HBO or NBC, it's just, it's just the Pete Dominic show, the Mike Papatonio show or whatever, and, and you aggregate a following. There's no necessarily centralized media. It's so much easier to do. Yes, it used to be like that. 1985, there were 57 independent media organizations. Now there are, what, five? Uh, the chances of it moving away from that are slim. Unless there is a cultural movement, and that cultural movement is away from corporate media to social media, and we see it happening. If you talk to people that have been doing this as long as I have, I'm seeing it day to day. I'm seeing corporate media struggling to try to keep up with what's happening with social media. So what you do every day, Pete, absolutely matters. It's so critical. I know every time Sam Cedar and Bobby Kennedy and I go on the air, what we're saying is going to be bounced all over all over the media, if, right. if it's a podcast, if it's a video like we're doing here in our office as we talk, it's going to be bounced all over the country, and there will be change related to that. You're videotaping your side of our interview? Yes, yes. Oh, I and should have, inter- I should have videotaped mine. We could have put them together, Mike. You'll see that cut up, and you'll see it. So That's how social media works. Uh, uh, Pete, look, the, 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 the secret to your success is you believe in what you do. Yeah. You're on the right side of things, and it's not. And everybody's not going to agree with you. As, as we've seen just in this interview, there's things that you and I disagree with, but they're small. The big picture is we know what has to happen on important issues like how we treat people, uh, we, the, on issues like climate change, uh, very important issues that are gaining changers for this entire world it's the most important issue to me and that's the one i'm the uh, most most active on as an advocate as an educator climate change conservation uh keeping kids connected to nature um uh, and let's wrap on that i mean because obviously um your partner rfk jr is a huge activist on it how, how, how you know, it was not not one question in four debates, including the vice presidential vice presidential debate about climate change. How much of this is about corporate media and ratings and that issue? Maybe not getting them as many eyeballs, or people not understanding that issue, and obviously the denialists. Uh, you know, yeah. where that. I mean, how it's, much of an issue? How, how, it's it's just, not it's not just media. A lot of it is media, but they're they're part. Of, since we've talked about human nature a little bit, let's talk about it just very quickly. And that is that there is something about human nature that is they're terrified. Is uh, we're terrified. I mean, Americans are terrified. <laughs> we're terrified of everything. My God. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We, that's we're, why we're, we carry guns, and that we're just we're we're fearful people. Yep. Because of that fear, what we do is we bring we we put together, as you pointed out, a protective mechanism, and that is to say, G this isn't going to affect me. We don't even have the decency to, to ask ourselves, well, if it doesn't affect you, how's it going to affect your children and your grandchildren? Because we are so fearful. And that fear is very difficult to overcome. Uh, <clears throat> great, great 
pleasure getting you on the show finally, Mike. Uh, really, like I said, I've been a fan for a long time. I never talked to you. I hope you'll come on again, and I hope folks will uh, go buy his new novel, Law and Disorder. Listen to Mike on the radio. Uh, really appreciate it, Mike. Thank you, Pete.